All right, so we're going to do a little exercise this morning before we actually get into our lesson. We have a test, and those who fail the test, nothing will happen to them. So, all right, so I have some questions. Uh, the questions are on the, uh, you know, the questions are on the sheets. Before we start our actual class, will take not a long time, just a, a different way of reviewing. So I'll read the questions out, they're on, your, they're on your sheets, but I'll read the questions out for those who might be uh, watching online or you know, have a DVD of this particular class a little later on. So uh, we've, got, uh, we've looked at the seven major doctrines, we've looked at five major doctrines. Could you name three? Could you name three of the major doctrines? We've discussed five of them, there are seven in all. Name three. Obviously, some have you know, jumped into this class a little later than others, so that's okay too. Name three. I'm not going to take a whole lot of time giving you 10 minutes to think about it. You know it, you don't. Three of the major doctrines. Okay, question number two. How many sub-doctrines are there under one of the particular major doctrines? <laughs> How many sub-doctrines are there under, or that explain, one of the seven major doctrines? How many sub-doctrines? The plan of salvation, or the plan of reconciliation, is described by which five sub-doctrines? Just give it a shot. We said there are 10 sub-doctrines underneath one of, the, you know, one of the major doctrines and these 10 explain this major one. And the first five of these sub-doctrines is actually the plan of salvation or the plan of reconciliation. See if you can name five of them. Don't worry about spelling, I'll throw them up on the you know, on the screen after. Five sub-doctrines that actually explain the plan of salvation or that consist of the plan of salvation. All right, and then question number four, the plan of salvation, those first five, um, are described in five different ways. The plan is described from five different perspectives and these make up the next five sub-doctrines. Can you remember any one of those? Looking at you know, the plan of salvation from different perspectives. Five different perspectives. All right, and today we're going to study, this is a bonus question just in case, on the off chance that you might. I'll give you the first two blanks. Today we study doctrine of, <laughs> there's the first, I'm giving you a hint, doctrine of, we're not supposed to give out the answers, uh, juice. We're not supposed to shout out the answer. Write it down. But that, that's why I said it's a bonus. All right, so let's take a look at the, uh, let's take a look at the answers here. There, there's the graph. That's finally, I wanted to kind of put this graph up here. You've got the whole thing. Well, not all of them. You haven't got all seven major doctrines, but we will eventually. So three of the five that we've studied so far, the five major doctrines we've studied so far, the inspiration of the Bible, the deity of Christ, original goodness, the fall of man, and then reconciliation. Those are five of the seven major ones that we are studying. If you're curious, number six and seven, uh, six is the doctrine of the kingdom and seven is the doctrine of salvation. So we'll get into those a little later on. 
Uh, anybody any, anybody uh, get three of those? Anybody? Anybody get three? Oh, well, a couple of hands go up, okay. How many sub-doctrines? How many? Ten. Yeah, ten. Ten sub-doctrines. Ten sub-doctrines under the doctrine of reconciliation. The doctrine of reconciliation has ten sub-doctrines that explain it. Okay. Then we said the plan of reconciliation or the plan of salvation, whatever, is described by which five sub-doctrines? So there were five of these. Election, you know, God chooses Christ. Predestination, God knows in advance that His choice of Christ and His choice of the plan of salvation is going to work. He knows the end from the beginning. The doctrine of atonement, you know, Christ dies for the sins of men, you know, the substitution, atonement, He pays for it. There's all kinds of ways to say this, but they're all included in the idea of the doctrine of atonement. The teaching of atonement teaches us that uh, God sends Jesus to make payment, a moral payment for our sins. Doctrine of atonement, redemption, uh, because of what, uh, atonement is what Jesus did, Redemption is what the result of what Jesus did. What is the result of the atonement? Well, redemption is the result of atonement. We're free. His atonement frees us. And then regeneration. So now that we're free, now what? Now what happens to us? Well, we are regenerated. We have a new life. Born again, all those terms that talk about uh, the new life, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. You know, all, the, all the ways that the Bible you know, writers describe the transformation that takes place when uh, you know, you're from sinner to saint, all those things, that's the doctrine of regeneration. The idea is that when you're reading the Bible and, some, and, and one of the writers is describing, you know, uh, we've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. You understand the, uh, the imagery there. But hopefully after this course, you'll also understand, you'll be saying to yourself, oh, he's talking about regeneration. Or in the Gospel of John, where Jesus says, you have to be born again, right? Using the imagery of being born, coming to life again. You know that, you know, what, you know the imagery he's talking about, but what's the theology? He's talking about regeneration. So the Bible talks about the same themes over and over again, just using different imagery. Okay. And then we said there are another five sub-doctrines under reconciliation, and the next five sub-doctrines describe the plan of salvation from different perspectives. And so adoption explains God's plan of salvation from a human perspective. Doctrine of justification explains it from a legal perspective. The doctrine of perfection describes the plan of salvation from a heavenly perspective. Sanctification from an inward perspective. Salvation from an eschatological perspective. Always these five sub-doctrines, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, they're talking about the first five. Okay? They're talking about the first five, but they just look at it from a different perspective. Okay. And then today we are going to study the uh, doctrine of sanctification. Any questions? We good? All right. Any, just a little, get your brain going here. So today we're going to talk about sanctification, sub-doctrine of sanctification. Uh, the word sanctification uh, does not uh, appear as such. Get my notes here. No English word actually to directly translate this biblical idea. So the English word is a transliteration of two Latin words. The word sanctus, which means holy, and facere, to make, to make holy, sanctification. Now the meaning of the basic Hebrew and Greek words was to, was to set something apart, or in some instances, you know, to 
something becomes bright or brighter uh, as in the quantity of light that it has. It shines more greatly than something else. So in the Old Testament, any person or thing that was set apart by God for his personal use was considered sanctified. It was made holy. Not because of what it was, but because God took what it was and He set it apart for His own particular use. And so when God took something, whatever it was, it could be a rock, it could be a place, it could be a thing. If He set it apart for a particular use, then that thing became holy because of what God did uh, to it. Now, common things, places and people took on a special value by virtue of their being chosen by God for His purpose. So you had you know, places, altars, temples, people, so on and so forth. You know, there's a reason why we, not, I don't know if we call it that, but a lot of people, you know, they use the word sanctuary. You ever hear people say, oh, we'll meet in the sanctuary. We call it the auditorium, but a lot of people call it the sanctuary for the meeting room where the church conducts public worship to God. And the idea behind that, the reason they do that, is that, that place, that space has been set apart, quote, sanctified for a special purpose in the service of God. We, you know, people set that place apart, so it's called the sanctuary. Now one of the reasons why some people are, you know, they're sensitive about using it for other reasons that are not connected to uh, to worship. You know, here, I mean, you know, we realize it's an auditorium. What, 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 what's important is our attitude when we gather together, an attitude of worship and respect and so on and so forth, because we're coming before God with a special purpose, right? A sanctified purpose. We're here to worship. We don't, you know, we don't consider our auditorium like a, quote, holy place, because a lot of stuff goes on in, well, I mean, <laughs> if you were here for VBS, <laughs> you know, but I'll tell you one thing, there are some places that what, what we did at VBS would not fly at all. And I'm, I'm not just talking about the, you know, the goofy stuff that went on after, you know, with Hal dressed up as the gorilla and all that. I just mean with kids yelling and screaming and you know, doing clapping hands and oh, oh that, that wouldn't wash in, in certain places because they're very sensitive to the idea that the auditorium or the sanctuary uh, is a place only for for worship. That's why some, some churches you know, uh, don't like to, um, you know, they won't build a multi-purpose building. And when I say multi-purpose, the auditorium has chairs instead of pews. So the chairs can be moved back and the, 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 the youth can use it to, to play basketball or games and then we could you know, move the chairs and bring tables in and you know, have a, a potluck meal. You know, and some, some religious groups, you know, they, they wouldn't do that. You know, the, the auditorium or the sanctuary is only for public worship and nothing else. You know, they'll build another building somewhere else you know, in order to do those type of activities. And so that's, that's their right to do that approach. But I just wanted to explain that idea. Uh, so in the Bible, being set apart or sanctified for a specific purpose or task means that a new quality of life is expected from those who are consecrated. That word consecrate, just another way of saying set apart or sanctify. All these words mean the same thing. Holy, sanctified, consecrated, all mean the same thing. Set apart by God for a particular uh, use. Now, in the process of sanctification, it is always uh, the greater who sets aside the lesser. You know, in, in, in worldly example, you know, it's generals who set aside lesser ranked soldiers for certain positions and duties, not vice versa. You know, the private doesn't come up to the general and say, hey, you want to go get my car? You know, <laughs> it doesn't work like that, right? It's the other way around. The general is the one that assigns people to, to, to tasks, and, and that's the way it should be, shouldn't it? Um, uh, the point I'm making is that the greater the superiority of the one, the more significant the consecration. For example, being appointed teacher representative by the principal of a school, that's one type of setting apart, versus being appointed teacher of the year by the governor. 
the higher the person setting apart, the greater the honor and responsibility of the person you know, who has been set apart. Uh, you can be appointed city manager by the Choctaw Council, or you can be appointed secretary of state by the president of the United States. You know? The higher you go, the greater the prestige. So the greater superiority of the one doing the setting apart, the more superior the quality of life or sanctified state enjoyed by the one who is being set apart. So you kind of see where I'm going with this. From a uh, major Christian doctrine perspective, consider the greatness of the one who separates us from the world to now live in Christ. So in Genesis chapter one, verse one to three, it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless and void, the darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light and there was light. And then one other passage I want to read, 50, Isaiah 57, it says, For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy, I dwell on a high and holy place, and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit, in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. The point I'm making with these two scriptures is that these scriptures describe the one who does the setting apart in our case. That's how high the one who sets us apart is. The one who creates the world, the one who says, let there be light, and there is light. The one who is high above everyone else, above presidents and kings and conquerors. So if this is the position of the one who does the setting apart, the sanctifying, imagine the quality of life to which those who are set apart are called. So we understand what sanctification is. It's a setting apart for a purpose. And we understand who does it. God Himself does it through Jesus Christ and His Word. So the president might appoint someone, or uh, the, the governor might uh, you know, examine, there might be a contest you know, uh, about uh, you know, the best teacher. Those, those are the ways that humans appoint other humans. You know, there might be rules and regulations the way God does it is He chooses us through Christ and His Word. He calls those to come out of the world. He calls those to come and be set apart. Uh, so uh, that's how it's done. That's how the sanctification process works. But what is the sanctified state like? Well, in the Old Testament, we could follow the clearly marked changes of those who were set apart for the priesthood, for example. I mean, you had to be of a certain tribe, and then you had to be of a certain family, and then you had to have certain physical, well, it didn't ha you didn't have to have physical traits. You, you had to be a man, first of all, that's one thing, but it's what you didn't have. You didn't have any scars. You didn't have a, you know, a missing foot. You, you weren't blind. In other words, there were no physical blemishes that could be you know, that could be perceived. So there were certain, a certain criteria for those who were set apart for the priesthood. And then those who were set apart for the priesthood received special garments to wear, the ephod and so on and so the crown, you know, all that type of thing. And they were given instructions on their lifestyle. They had to marry someone, a virgin, within their own tribe and so on and so forth. Um, they, uh, there are pages and you know, chapters and chapters in the Bible describing the work of the priests, how to cut up the animal, how to burn the animal, how to offer the animal, you know, all the various tasks that the priest had to do. You know, when I read that over and over again, I'm saying, man, that was a hard job. I mean, they were constantly on duty, but you knew what the task and the lifestyle was of an individual who was sanctified, because it's spelled out. You know? I mean, the minutest details are spelled out as to the lifestyle of the priest. So the question is, what are the changes for those who are set apart in Christ? Because it's exactly the same person, God, who is setting apart individuals, us. Well, the Old Testament priesthood prefigured this future sanctification of believers in Jesus Christ. 
their sanctification was carried out on an external basis. You know, the priests in the Old Testament, their clothing, their work, their lifestyle, who they would marry and so how they would succeed. I mean, you know, the succession, who could continue in the priesthood. Christians' sanctification, on the other hand, is carried out on an inward basis. We don't get special clothing. We don't get to wear a special hat. You know, we, don't, we don't have that. So in this context, the doctrine of sanctification therefore explains two things. First of all, it explains the new status of those who are reconciled. So in the Old Testament, there was a new status for those who were chosen as priests. They couldn't go back to their old lifestyle. They had a new lifestyle, right? So in Colossians 3.26, Paul explains the new status that we have and the changes that have taken place. He says, for you are all sons of God through faith in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So first of all, Paul describes the nature of the change. Christians were, quote, in the world, the world of sin, the world of disbelief, the world of death. And now they have been taken out of this world through faith and they have been set apart and consecrated to Christ. So our old status was that of sinners condemned to die. Our new status is that of saints separated to live in union with other believers in the body of Christ. That's the new status that we have. This new status includes all of the blessings described in the previous doctrines as you know, aliveness and freedom and perfection and sonship. We get all of that stuff. And these are some of the features of our new status in Christ. So first of all, the doctrine of sanctification explains the change that has taken place. Just like uh, you know, we read in Leviticus and, and, and Numbers you know, uh, in the Old Testament the change that took place uh, of those who were transferred from simply belonging to one family to becoming the priests serving God uh, at first uh, at the tabernacle and then later on in the temple. Um, a second thing that the doctrine of sanctification explains is the new purpose of those people who have been sanctified. Again, in the Old Testament, lots of description on the process of that sanctification, you know, what they went through to become the priests, and then a lot of instruction as to, okay, now that you are a priest, here's what you're going to do. This is your job, this is your life, okay? Well, in the same way, there are a lot of instructions for Christians. Now that you're in this sanctified position, here's what your life is going to be like, okay? So as I said, the Old Testament priests were set aside with a new status that enabled them to fulfill the new purpose, servants of the temple and a sacrificial system. The new purpose of Christians is to manifest Christ to the world. That's the new purpose of those who have been reconciled. Matthew says it, or Jesus says it, and Matthew says, you are the light of the world, a city set on a hill, cannot be hidden. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So just like the priests were set aside and equipped to do a certain work, Christians are also set aside in a particular way. How are we set aside? Well, you know, we express our faith in repentance and baptism. And in that, in that way, we, we enter into our new sanctified state. But now that we're in our sanctified state, what do we do? You know, do we offer sacrifices like the priests? You know, do we... So Jesus says, what you do is you manifest Christ. You shine. You're like a light that shines. This is the purpose for which we were set apart or sanctified in Christ. All that we do serves this purpose in one way or another. So the sub-doctrine of sanctification explains the new status that we have, which is in Christ, and the new purpose that we have, 
to manifest Christ uh, to the world. Okay? Now in the Old Testament, the priest's sanctification addressed mainly the outward appearance and the tasks of these men. In the New Testament, the Christian sanctification is spiritual in nature and it affects the inward, the inward man. All right. So all of the things that we do as Christians, it's very helpful if we get it into perspective, that all of the things that we do as Christians um, these things are done in order to shine the light. You know that little song that we sing at VBS, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. You know that song? That's, I mean, we're already teaching little children what the main purpose of the Christian life is, but we're doing it in a simple song that they can all realize. But all of us here, all adults, parents, grandparents, some great-grandparents, you know, that song applies to us too. Our task in Christ as sanctified people is to shine. You remember I said the word sanctified, it meant set apart and in some instances conveyed the idea of brightness. Well, that's, that's the point. You know, those who are in Christ have a brightness, a shine, uh, something that enables them to shed light in a dark world. Uh, what's the promise at the end of the world when the, the new heavens and the new earth and you know, we go to be with God? What, what does the book of Revelation say? What's the light that's going to be there? It says we won't need the sun or the moon. Why? Christ will be the light. He'll be the light gives you a little bit of insight into, you know, I wonder if you think he was talking about wattage or lumens, that's it. You, know, you measure light by lumens, how many lumens there are, how bright a light is. You think he was talking about lumens there, that the light will be Jesus? I, I'm, I don't think so. I think there's another kind of light. Like, you know, sometimes we say, um, well, I'm glad you shed some light on that topic. Does the person actually mean you brought a flashlight and you, no. What does that person mean that you've done? You've brought understanding. You've, you've, you've brought an insight that clarifies, that gives knowledge and understanding. I tend to think that that's, that's the idea of the light. What, what, what does Jesus say? That you shall know God, and this is eternal life, that you shall know God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Well, wait a minute, you mean eternal life, the, 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 the substance of eternal life is, is what? Is that you shall know God, meaning that our ongoing existence will be to know God more deeply, more profoundly, more intimately, forever, and you know it goes on forever because God is eternal, there's no end. You know what kind of joy you get sometimes? You ever read your Bible, you're reading your Bible, you know, and, and, and you're reading your Bible and you've read something that you've read 20 times before. You know, you just, and then you go, ah, oh, I just saw something. I, and I've read that thing 10 times and I never noticed that. And it's like, isn't there a kind of a joy that fills you? You go, boy. And you know what that joy is? The substance of that joy? Nobody can take away the light that you have just seen. That truth that you've just recognized and understood after 10 times, you got it, oh I get it, and I see how those two pieces are connected. Nothing will ever change that. You've just gained a small piece of knowledge, a small piece of the whole, which is God. And so the sanctified state is the ability of the Christian, the responsibility of the Christian to shed that light in this world. Because people are not drawn to a person who simply condemns them. <laughs> a person is drawn to someone who gives them something. So we can't give the world money 
We're not rich. We can't give the world power. We don't have any power. But we can give them light. That's the responsibility that God has given to us, has transferred us out of the darkness into the what? The kingdom of light. We are light. Okay, so this is uh, the end of part one of this lesson on sanctification. Next time we're going to look at some errors that have been taught about this particular doctrine and, and what these errors had, have led people to think. All right? And we're also going to look at the three stages of sanctification that all believers experience. All believers experience three stages of sanctification. Next time, there's just too much material for one class this time, so we're going to stop here. We're going to pick it up next time. Just keep right on going through sanctification. All right, that's it for this time. Thank you. <laughs>